The Super Media Bros Podcast is a founding member of the Odd Pods Media Network. Can you believe this shit was 23 years ago? Considering my age? Sure, because I don't remember it. <laughs> Super Media Bros. You know more than you let on, and that's the funniest part about it, too. Okay, all jokes aside, because at the last wrestling review that we did, I did a whole lot of, who is that guy? I knew who they were. Right. I, I just got to play into, like, my age. But as far as, like, oh, do you remember this back when this happened? I either wasn't born yet, or I was two. Like, what? No, I don't fucking remember this pay-per-view, goddammit. You were 12. Welcome to episode 211 of the Super Media Bros Podcast. I'm Midnight Agent Raw. And I'm Special Delivery Dev. And now, Western Union presents WWF St. Valentine's Day Massacre. Today, we are covering WWF St. Valentine's Day Massacre from 1999. The very last in your house branded pay-per-view before they just started giving them permanent titles. And even then the titles never stayed permanent. No, they, they still don't like, we still get like revamps and everything revamps, new bullshit, too many live events, too many pay-per-views. Yeah. Like now they're just coming up with bullshit, like day one and all that. I'm like, guys, we don't need all of this. I was good with just the 12. Yeah, I mean, shit, some of those we can even cut out. Right, like, I'm good with AEW giving us, like, five to six a year at best, maybe, maybe four, maybe five. Yeah, I I feel like AEW does four pay-per-views a year that I can recall, but for WWE, because of its scope, I think six sounds about right. Yeah, whenever they were just doing the big five, that was enough for me. Yeah. But, all jokes aside... This was actually a pretty fun pay-per-view. It really was. So on this card, not including the Sunday Night Heat pre-match builds, there were eight matches. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Were there? I know it doesn't feel like that, does it? No, not at all. I think that's because the first four were not very long. No, uh, particularly the first match, like the opening with Gold Dust and Blue Dust, like... That was a a job match. That was a squash. Yeah, let's just go ahead and talk about that briefly. So an iconic character from the Attitude Era, played by Dustin Rhodes, who could make any fucking gimmick really work, honestly. And the Blue Meanie doing his Blue Dust bullshit, which is Brian Heffron, you know, the BWO, (laughs) the Blue fucking World Order. Which the fact that that existed at all just amuses me, man. Because, like, back then, there were a lot of carny bullshit gimmicks. That's up there, though, just because of how, like, strange it was. And not even, like, strange in the gold dust way, but just kind of like, what the fuck? Who sat down and said, this is what we got to do? The same guy that made Cody Rhodes into Stardust. (sighs) Okay, fair enough. Yeah. This was a quick match, three minutes, four seconds long, and... It didn't even feel that long. No, it really didn't, but the fucking ass slapping and the nut (laughs) shots and the ball kicking and the gold and blue and the... I mean, come on. It was... Let's be honest. Like you said, it's a fucking squash match. Just watching the blue meanies ripples just fucking jiggle around. I love the blue meanie, though. Oh, yeah. It was fucking hilarious, but I'm just saying, like, Good God, I was watching this. I was like, that is a lot of meat. Yeah, but Goldust takes the victory in a very quick fashion. And then it moves right along to Bob Holly before. I think this was like the genesis of Hardcore Holly versus Al Snow for the Hardcore Championship. And it was vacant at this point in time, which I think is hilarious that they're the whole time the commentary team was sitting there like, 
Can Bob Holly shed Sparky Plug? <laughs> Bro, what the? I hated, hated that fucking gimmick. And you know, I just recently found out that Vince McMahon gave him the fucking NASCAR car that they had for him. Like he owns it or like, owned like it. The, the actual vehicle. Yeah. Just gave it. He owns it. Yeah. <laughs> what the fuck? I mean, dude. I would absolutely take that as a consolation for having to be the fucking shittiest gimmick on the card in the mid nineties. Absolutely. I'm just baffled. Hold on. You're baffled because Vince McMahon would rather be like, I take this car. And instead of him being like, well, here's some more money. Basically. <laughs> like, like, but also at the same point, I'm like, I picture him being like, oh, I can't give him that car. That, that costs money. Does Vince McMahon really look like the kind of guy that watches NASCAR though? True. He probably couldn't wait to get rid of that piece of shit. Okay, so you think they gave him the car, and now he just gave it to Holly? You think that's what happened? Okay. He, yeah, he, it's like a hand-me-down gift where he's just like, <laughs> I don't really want this. Here, Bob, you can have it. And he's trying to act like it's it's a big deal that he's getting this car. You know what I mean? Like, he's upselling it. You, you heard it, pal. <laughs> <laughs> it's for all the hard work you've done. You've earned it, pal. Pats him on the back. <laughs> We'll give you a one day tag team title reign with, with the kid. <laughs> the kid. Yeah. Cause him and him and one, two, three actually won the tag belts for a day at the 90, <laughs> at the 1995 rumble. They won it and they lost it the next night on raw. Never to be seen or heard from again. Fuck no, man. What a, what a shit team. And then Bob Ollie's just like, well, I guess I'll hold the hardcore title a whole shitload of times. Dude. Once they got into the Mississippi river, in 30 degree weather wearing like the, the wrestling trunks, like the speedo looking things. I was thinking to myself, how much you got to pay me to do this? I know man, because I can't even begin to imagine the amount of syringes and yeah, cause it's the late nineties. They didn't give a fuck. No dude. And like all the sharp bullshit that was probably in that fucking water. There's a couple of spots in here that make me laugh. There's the spot where Bob hits Al Snow with that big fucking branch out there, and it snaps off and hits the camera guy, and then fucking <laughs> Lawler goes, even the camera guy's hardcore. <laughs> you fucking idiot. But it was actually a really entertaining and fun match. Oh, absolutely. I feel like this is what the 24-7 title could and should have been, and to be fair, was for the first, like, what would you say, month and a half? Yeah, like it was fun at first, but God, that's something that just got ran to the ground. It really did. But this match was about 10 minutes long. Really? Yeah. And, and these matches were pretty fun to watch. You know, I know we generally watch a lot of the ECW stuff, like the old school ECW stuff. And we were like, oh, my God, like their company didn't really have rules. So you could have like tables and chairs and flaming bats and barbed wire and all kinds of shit in any given match. But these for like the WWF crowd was, a, they were a lot of fun, you know? Yeah. I mean, it was good filler while still feeling like, like there was a championship involved and it was comedy. Yeah. It was really this weird, like, okay, let's entertain these fuckers. Let's, let's give them something that's going to maybe be dangerous, but also be a little bit of comedy fill at the same time. Because let's be honest, this stuff is very tame, comparatively speaking to shit like what's going on in GCW right now. Well, that's a, yeah, I mean, I know it's a completely different like thing. Like deathmatch is definitely different than this kind of shit. But at the same time, it's very tame, comparatively speaking. But for what it was in 1999 was entertaining. It was the wwf's version of entertainment where ecw just kind of had them by the balls in this category but they were like ah oh, fuck it we're gonna try it anyway but again a lot of fun bob ollie goes over rolls his ass up in a fucking fence and pins him <laughs> and he's just sitting there bitching the whole time oh, get me out of here <laughs> <laughs> fucking al snow i was actually just watching a, a little clip of him doing like wrestling coaching and all that shit it was actually pretty cool yeah, it's hard to believe that most of these dudes that we grew up watching are coaches now. Yeah. Well, I mean, dude, look at how they carried themselves. They 
even the lower card guys carry themselves like stars. Yeah, that, and that's the thing about this era in wrestling. WCW, WWF, and ECW, everybody felt like a fucking star. Everybody. I know, and it's so... Like, I thought that that was just me because I'm going backwards in time and hearing all these names over the years and then seeing them, they feel like legends. But even as I'm watching them, they felt larger than life. And I know that's cliche to say that. They but were, though. They yeah. really were. Because they all felt like rock stars. They treated themselves like that. Different times, my dude. Next match is the big boss man versus Midian. A.K.A. Phineas Godwin. Like, now I want to point something out. There is a fucking Ministry of Darkness segment that's happening, which this was the era that The Undertaker was kind of leaning in the satanic portion of his character. Which I fucking loved that. I did too. Now, this motherfucker has his ministry, which is including Viscera, Edge, Christian Gangrel, you, you name it. They're there. The, the Acolytes. They're all around this barrel fire going and Taker is cutting this boss ass promo, right? I got taken completely out of it when he said Valentine's uh, with an M Valentine's <laughs> Day. Texan fuck. You Texan son of a bitch. <laughs> the under Texan. <laughs> like, just, could you just like everybody out there? If you've not seen this, it is on Peacock, but you just see the undertaker. He's just like this St. Valentine's Day. And you're just like, oh, Son of a bitch, you took me right out of it. You had me. You fucking had me. Now, was this live or was that a taped promo? This was obviously a taped promo that was supposed uh -huh. to be a home video exclusive. So there's really no excuse. There is no goddamn excuse. Whoever edited that or just shot that. They left it in on purpose. They had to have done it just to fuck with Mark, like rib his ass. They're like, you know what? He probably Mark probably said some shit to that guy at one point in his, his career. And he's like, you know, fuck Mark right now. I'm going to make him look stupid. I'm not going to correct him. Like I said, if, if it were live, I totally understand. <laughs> stupid though, dude. <laughs> oh, God. But anyway, so this is the middle of the corporation versus the Ministry of Darkness angle. Which is really strange because they're both heel factions at this point. Yeah. But it eventually becomes the corporate ministry. I don't know if you remember that bullshit. Not really, because like whenever people talk about this era, they, they do talk about the corporate era and all that stuff. And they do talk about the Ministry of Darkness, but they don't ever mention that. Like, honestly, I, I just read glimpses of it. You know, the whole higher power angle. Vaguely. Where Vince was like, it was me, Austin. It was me yes, all along. Yes, That's the, yes. That was the reveal because the t Undertaker kept saying that he's serving a higher power and the higher power was Vince. So they combined the corporation and the ministry. Now, was this around the time period where Taker put Austin on like crucified him and all that? Okay. Yep. Because I've never seen footage of it, but I have seen a photograph I, it was on some article years ago of like uh, most controversial WWF moments and things like that. That was the angle they played where Austin was going to save Stephanie because he was reluctant to do it. But it was kind of that whole angle where it's like, well, Austin's not completely heartless, you know? Yeah. But no, I remember that very, very vividly. But yeah, this was around that time. And this match is stupid to say, but this match literally sets up. Boss Man versus Taker at, in uh, Hell in a Cell at Mania. That's all this match existed to do because Boss Man wins in like a little over six minutes and then the ministry comes down and just whoops his fucking ass. Which is what's crazy. Okay, so this was a six minute match and halfway through the crowd started chanting boring. Mm hmm. How can you be boring? It was six minutes total. So after three minutes, you got bored? To be very, very fair, it was slow. This was the longest six minutes I have seen in quite some time. I wasn't a big fan of this match, but I, I will agree with you there. But I do understand at that time. Think about, they just came off of a hardcore title match, dude. I guess, but it's not a good follow-up to that match. But also, dude, maybe this is just 
going into the times that we are in now because my mind immediately goes, oh, yeah, this was a cool down. I mean, to be fair, it was the piss break match. Yeah, so. I hate to say it, but it, it was. And I love Big Boss Man, so. Same. Maybe I was just excited just to see him. I don't know. But I, I didn't. It was slow, but I didn't find it boring. No, it wasn't as boring as the crowd thought it was, but it was definitely kind of slow. But, but yeah, Boss Man picks the victory up, gets his ass handed to him by the ministry, and it sets up Taker and Boss Man at Hell in a Cell at WrestleMania 15, which, my God. <laughs> I think we'll get into that WrestleMania at some point in the future. Oh, I certainly hope so. The next matchup was Jeff Jarrett and Owen Hart versus D'Lo Brown and Mark Henry for the tag championships. Fucking love Mark Henry, dude. This was the middle of the sexual chocolate gimmick. <laughs> My God. This is when he was with Ivory. Yes. Okay, so Deborah was accompanying Jeff and Owen. This was a great match, by the way. Owen and Jeff worked so well together as a tag team. I thought they were very underrated as a team. Yeah, like as I was watching it, I was like, hold on, why why don't I remember more of this? Granted. Oh, and by the, by the time I was, like, able to process and remember wrestling live, Owen was already gone. Right. But I'm still like, okay, as far as, like, lists of tag teams, I don't ever read this. And it's a shame because I was like, this is enjoyable. I want to say this about Owen, and I think people don't really look at it this way, but I will tell you this right now. Owen has had great chemistry with damn near everybody he's made a tag team with. You look at Jim Neidhart, Yokozuna, Davey Boy Smith, his brother Brett, fucking Jeff Jarrett. The dude has had great chemistry all around and has just, I've just named five people off right there. And, and Coco Beware, he's had good partners and he's made his tag teams that much more meaningful. That just goes to show not only his actual talent, but his personality, being able to work with damn near anybody. God. Exactly, dude. It's, like, it's insane. What a gem. And to me, this was kind of like Jared's high point in his career. Not saying that the shit he did in TNA wasn't worth a fuck, but his, the stuff he did in TNA wasn't really worth a fuck. <laughs> Not that you were a shit, but you were just kind of a shit. Look. I'm not the biggest Jeff Jarrett, Mark. I'm really not. I appreciate what the man has done. I just didn't. I just did not care for his TNA run. It felt like this is a wrestling show starring me. Yeah, that's why, like, whenever we went to WrestleMania and they were doing, like, the Hall of Fame ceremony and everything and Jeff Jarrett was there, I clapped and I was just kind of like, good for him. Just wasn't my cup of tea. And you were like, really? I was like, yeah. Why? And I was like. He just came off like such a egomaniac. Yeah, and and again, I'm not I'm not sitting here to completely shit on Jarrett as, no, as a no, dude, but no. like this was definitely the high point for me of his career because I mean he went to WCW not long after this. Like, you know, he infamously held up Vince McMahon for money over the Intercontinental title. <laughs> it's so funny. What a fucking legend at the same time, though. It's so fucking funny. Like, I'm going to sit here and trash him, but by God, what a legend for that shit. It was yeah. funny as fuck. I mean, it, here's the thing. I'll trash him as a promoter. Okay, yeah, I'll agree with you there. But as a performer and everything? Okay, yeah, you, yeah. Can't, you, can't, you can't deny that he's a great wrestler. But right. he was just never, like, my thing. You know what I'm saying? Like Exactly. I, he, I, I legitimately, at the time, was pissed off when he beat Razor Ramon for the Intercontinental title as a younger person. Yeah. You now, granted, I wasn't smartened up quite then. But even after the fact, I was like, they really put the belt on him over Scott Hall. <laughs> you fucking assholes. <laughs> so, but anyway, th getting back into this match, very, very well done match. Great chemistry between both the teams. Uh, the finish of the match is when Owen just shatters the fuck out of that guitar over Henry's leg. And then Jarrett locks in the figure four for the submission victory. And the entire time, Jerry Lawler is on demon time. My man's was aggressively horny. <laughs> like, as he always was back then, but fuck. Go directly to horny jail, Jerry. Dude. Like, the whole time I was like, bro, are you okay? <laughs> like, 
Right, dude? Like, who gave you blue balls like a motherfucker? Fuck! Like, I know that that was his gimmick back then, but... And, and honestly, I think this match was where I was like, okay, all right, all right, all right. Because it, it's the perfect encapsulation of my opinion of Jerry Lawler's commentary, where, oh, dude, this is starting off great. This is the Jerry Lawler I remember as a little kid, not the 2014 version or whenever, you know, whenever everything had to be PG and tame. I thought he was just insufferable then. But back then, in the 90s, this is great. And then as it kept going and going and going, and it dawned on me, Jerry Lawler wasn't commentating hardly at all this entire pay-per-view. No, Lawler's the color guy of the team. I understand that, but it felt like he didn't add any form of commentary. It was just comments. It was comic relief, basically. It was. It was almost, it was almost like Jerry Lawler was kind of doing like a Beavis and Butthead thing where he was watching wrestling and just making just sly comments here and there. To be fair, I think that's kind of why Vince kept him there. Not that like he didn't value him on the table. But I think he mostly kept him there because he was good at that. Like we were talking about with Jeff Jarrett, just wasn't for me. Because whenever I'm watching some form of sport, whether it is pro wrestling or football, basketball, anything, I love commentary. And I think that's why I love Jim Ross so much, because he can do both. Yeah, Jim's really good at flipping between calling the action as he sees it and then making his little, you know, comments that are pretty fucking funny. Absolutely. It, that's what I love. And it it's it feels weird to say in 2022, but I'm listening to this shit and I'm like, "Damn. Michael Cole's a better commentator." Yeah. It fucking freaked me out a little bit. Right. And how dated this shit is, honestly. <laughs> like seriously, think about it. Which we'll get to a funny comment from Michael Cole later. <laughs> I know where this is going. Right. Let's take a quick break and we'll be right back. The leaders in male grooming have done it again. Take your grooming game to the next level and join 4 million other men worldwide who trust Manscaped. Devin, the performance package 4.0 is here from Manscaped. Right here? Right here. There it is. Look at it glistening in the light. Should I tell you what's inside? Yes, please. Okay, cool. So inside this package, you're going to find their Lawnmower 4.0 trimmer, the Weed Whacker Ear and Nose Hair Trimmer, the Crop Preserver Ball Deodorant, the Crop Reviver Toner, Performance Boxer Briefs, all inside of a travel bag to hold your goodies. A tra- For free? A free travel bag? Free travel bag, my dude. Oh my god, that's a game changer. It really is. Well, hold on, hold on. Tell me more. First off, the Performance Package 4.0 includes the new Lawnmower 4.0. This trimmer is insane. You know, I think it might just be goaded. The goat? I believe so. The greatest of all time, sir. That's a high order. Yes, it is. This fourth generation trimmer features a cutting edge ceramic blade to reduce grooming accidents thanks to their advanced skin safe technology. The Lawnmower 4.0 has a 7,000 RPM motor a new multifunction on-off switch that will engage a travel lock, and it gives you the ability to turn the 4000K LED spotlight on and off when you need a more precise shave. Did I mention it's waterproof? It needs to be. Do you want to take your grooming game to the next level? Elaborate. The Performance Package 4.0 includes the Weed Whacker to chop up the worst weeds in your nose and your ears. Well, my worst weeds are on my balls, but the weeds up there are pretty bad too. Well, the Weed Whacker is also waterproof, and it uses a 9,000 RPM motor-powered 360-degree rotary dual-blade system. This nose and ear hair trimmer provides proprietary skin-safe technology, which helps prevent nicks, snags, and tugs in those delicate spots. Good God. But that's not all. Tell me more. Seal the deal with Manscaped's liquid formulations. What? Yeah, dude. Their Crop Preserver Ball Deodorant for before leaving the house and the Crop Reviver Ball Toner for a mid-game ball check. Now I have a question. All right, shoot. Will the ball deodorant leave streaks the way my armpit deodorant does? Absolutely not, for it is a cream. A cream? That's right. Oh my God. 
That's right. And you'll be creaming yourself whenever you hear the deal that we have for you. 20% off plus free shipping at manscaped.com using our code SUPER. Manscaped is throwing two free gifts into this performance package. The Manscaped Boxers in the Shed Travel Bag so that you can bring your comfort and boxers to another level. Get 20% off plus free shipping with our code SUPER at manscaped.com. Again, 20% off plus free shipping with our code SUPER at manscaped.com. Thanks, Manscaped. You are awesome. Hey, you there. We've got a question for you. Are you tired of clickbait stories and the loudest voices driving discussions in culture and entertainment? If so, I'm Dylan. I'm Kendall. And I'm Corey. And we host the podcast From the Middle. We're middle-class guys living in the middle of America, in the middle chapters of our lives with points of view somewhere in the middle. We take a more reasonable and centrist approach in our discussions covering genres like comedy, culture, entertainment, and interviews with really interesting folks like business owners, comic creators, doctors, news anchors, New York Times best-selling illustrators, professional stand-up comics, and more. We really value a relaxed and conversational podcast, one that we hope is so fun and laid back, you'll forget you're not actually hanging out with us. So search at From the Mid Pod, just like it sounds, or check us out everywhere you can find podcasts. All right, now we're going to get into the second half of this pay-per-view. Not like it had an intermission, but God damn it, we need an intermission. Well, shit, it was a fucking three-hour event. True, but now we're getting into Val Venus with Ryan Shamrock versus Ken Shamrock for the Intercontinental Championship with Billy Gunn as the special guest referee. Shamrock is coming into this motherfucker as the champion, and the storyline of this is that Val Venus has been fucking Ken Shamrock's quote sister why do you say quote because that ain't his fucking sister yes it is no it's not yes it is it is alicia webb no her last name is shamrock don't ruin kayfabe her name's symphony and wcw look at them they're clearly related the hair gives it away <laughs> <laughs> but this match was about 16 minutes long 50, 15 minutes and 53 seconds now this was what you described as like Vince McMahon's doing. Yeah, like this was the most Vince McMahon thing I've ever seen in my life. The carny bullshit within the storyline, just how like taboo it all was. You've got three big jacked up fucking baby oiled men wrestling. You have the hot blonde on the side and then you have the fucking shenanigans on the outside. What part of this is not Vince McMahon? Yeah, and the weird thing is that it was a decent match with comedy from Billy Gunn. Oh, dude, Billy was fucking great here. Oh, yeah. So there's a, a line from Jerry that was pretty fucking funny during this. He goes, hey, Cole, you ever see all the movies that Val and Ryan did? No, I did. Siskel and Ebert gave it everything up. I was like, oh, my fucking God. See, and I had to think about it. I was like, okay, Cisco and Ebert. Uh, oh. Mm, yeah. Lawler well, making dick jokes on the low, but not quite on the low. No, it was low. Mm, yeah. Below the belt. True, true, true. Billy Gunn, again, being the comic relief with the fucking slow counts and like holding his shoulder going, uh. You know? I know. And at first, whenever he did it, I was like, oh, poor bastard. He wasn't expecting that. The mats would and then he did it again i was like oh okay okay i see what he's doing because dude i i didn't see the build up or anything so i wasn't sure of what the actual like i thought that was a shoot you know i thought he genuinely hurt his shoulder until i realized no he he's playing his fucking role being a little shit so what was the deal with that anyway like why was Billy Gunn a ref? Okay, so he volunteered to be the special referee in this match, but in story, he'd been feuding over the IC title with Shamrock. I don't remember exactly what it was, but Billy fucked up with management somehow. I don't remember if it's because he no-showed or he failed a drug test or he, he did something. Now, bear in mind, this is pre-wellness policy. Yeah, okay. Something happened 
where he pissed management off to the point where they jobbed his ass out to Ken Shamrock at the Rumble the month before, like tapped out to him clean. That's bad. Yeah, so he's still in the title picture, but it's him and Shamrock and now Val Venus is kind of in the middle of it. And Billy Gunn was at the point where he's like, I'm going to try to fuck Shamrock over in this match, which he does. But I have to laugh because... Have you ever noticed that Shamrock screams a lot? Yeah, it's not as intimidating and scary as I remember it being. Yeah, because I remember the commentators like, oh, my God, he's snapping. He's snapping. And I'm just like, no, he's just roid raging in the middle of the fucking ring. (laughs) That's what he's doing. Two things about this match that are, I believe, the only things memorable. One, Billy Gunn's refereeing in the comedy bullshit with that. Because I'll be honest, the crowd was flat as fuck until Billy started his shenanigans. And and that's the thing, too, is like they were hot as fuck for the entrances. But then whenever the match started, it's almost like they died. Like that's all they cared about was seeing them make their entrance. True. Second thing, Billy Gunn stops counting for Shamrock. (laughs) Clearly had the match won, just stops. They get into it. Shamrock fucking goes outside the ring and starts bitching at his sister. Oh, no. Are we really going to point this out? Yeah, we are. Because she helps Venus get to the ropes during a submission. So he gets pissed off and goes outside and starts bitching at her. He's like, what the fuck are you doing? What the hell are you doing? Slap me. (laughs) He fucking audibly says slap me. Clear as day in front of the camera. And I think that's the thing. Like, it would still look bad on television if you could read his lips. We've seen that a million times throughout the years with people calling spots and everything. But to hear it, that's bad, man. How do you not see the camera dude in your perif? He was having a conversation with his sister. It was a family matter, you know, (laughs) so he didn't see what was around him. I have to give credit where credit's due, though. Alicia Webb hit that slap without missing a beat, dude. Like, she didn't even fucking hesitate. It's like she was just waiting to do it or something, like, the whole day. Like, she didn't know it was going to happen, but she's just like, Ken's really annoying. I wish I could just slap the fuck out of him. And then he's out there, slap me. You know what? She probably remembered that she had to do the spot, but wasn't sure (laughs) when to do it. So as soon as he gave her the green light, she's like, yeet. And she smacked the fuck out of him, too. She said they're like, oh, yeah, fuck. So she slaps him. And then Billy comes out of the ring. They get into it. Shamrock, I think he shoves Billy or he hits him. And then Billy's like, oh, fuck this. And he punches him, throws him into the ring. Venus rolls him up and he fucking fast counts him. And he flips him off and leaves the fucking ring. <laughs> Comedy. Yeah, yeah. Like, like that's that sad to say, but the IC title match was comic relief. Oh, fuck. Think about that. I don't remember much about the match other than Billy Gunn being a shithead and the, and the slap me bit. Dude, and to think like, what, 10 years prior, that title was like just as big as a heavyweight championship. Yeah. Hell, even six years prior, maybe even less than that, if you held the IC title, that meant... Oh, yeah, whenever you drop this, you're definitely getting a main event push. Yep. And then it became a comedy spot. And, uh, yeah, no, times have not changed. No, they have not. The next match is Triple H and X-Pac versus China and Kane. China has recently turned heel on Degeneration X. And I can't even lie. This match was kind of a nothing burger. It was. But I think I enjoyed it more than you did just because it's like, oh, holy shit. Look at this. I get that. I think for me, it, again, was just a match to have Shane McMahon on commentary. Yeah, I could have done without that. Like, I don't know what his deal was. It it was setting him and X-Pac up for WrestleMania. That's literally like some no, of these no, matches I, existed I, I for get, just that. I, I get think that. But. <laughs> It was too much. You know how some people nowadays complain about Chris Jericho's commentary being, like, overdone? 
Yeah, you're talking about like on uh, Rampage and shit? Yeah. That's how it felt here times 10. Because Shane was literally sweat a, a full-blown, already formed droplet of sweat pouring down his forehead because he had been screaming so much. Scream McMahon. Bro, his daddy was coming out in him a little bit there, too, a couple times. Motherfucker, he was trying to earn his dad's love. He was just trying to be his love to Stephanie. Oh, my God. Vince really said, fuck them kids. Yeah, he fucking released him. I know. God damn it. How are you going to release your own fucking son? I don't know, but... Oof. <laughs> I mean, I know they never had the best relationship, but fuck. I know, it's pretty sad. But uh, Kane and China actually win this match because of the world's weakest looking choke slam to Hunter. And that's the thing when you said, hey, watch this choke slam. It's the <laughs> fucking most tepid thing you've ever seen. <laughs> and I watched it. I was like, yeah, that was pretty bad, but it'd be all right. Then you saw the replay from the other angle. Yeah, that second angle. I was like, what the fuck? Kane should have just. Tucked him in for bed after that. <laughs> so yeah, fucking put that's him down. the thing is like Triple H wasn't a guy that demanded to be treated softly. No, Hunter took some still to this day has taken some pretty good bumps. Yeah. So I'm, was. do you think he was hurt? Like maybe not even hurt, hurt, but just like, oh, hey, uh, I tweaked my shoulder during a workout or something like, can you be gentle? Well, if I remember correctly. I want to say this was during the time that Vince had the ring way more braced Uh where it was stiffer. Yes. Because I think Steve Austin on his podcast had said a few times how stiff that fucking ring was during that time period. Yeah. And they really didn't soften that bitch up until after Vince started taking bumps. How fucking hilarious too. (laughs) Like, my God, he probably hit that mat and was just like, you guys do this for a living? (laughs) No shit. I pay you for this. (laughs) He's probably sitting there thinking, well, good thing we don't have insurance. Oh, fuck. (laughs) So. But yeah, they, they win the match. China with the victory over Hunter. And then we finally get into the uh, dual main event. Where Mankind, as World Wrestling Federation champion, goes up against The Rock in a last man standing match. And the setup of this had been, they have been trading this title back and fucking forth. Mick Foley wins against The Rock on my birthday in 1999. And WCW never won again in the ratings. That's right, because you know, (laughs) that'll sure put some butts in the seats. So that happens. Then The Rock challenges him to the Rumble. Very brutal match. Wins against Foley in an I quit match. Mick wins the title back in the halftime heat empty arena match, which that was fucking entertaining as hell. If you ever get a chance to see that shit, it's funny. And then culminates. Well, I say culminates. It leads to this match. where like, oh, there must be a winner. Spoiler alert. It's a fucking draw. But let's actually <laughs> talk about the spots in this match. Because look, I'm not going to lie. I love this match. The finish fucking sucked. Yeah, whenever I was watching it, I kind of felt like underwhelmed. The crowd chanted bullshit at this ending, dude. And I I see why, because the match was fire, and it's The Rock versus Mankind in 1999. These two have unbelievable chemistry against one another. Well, you know what, though? It... Just look at them, okay, as two characters. You've got the movie star quality to the rock just the superstar embodied and then you've got mankind who's like this weird fucking igor plus frankenstein's monster hybrid he's a good foil exactly that's part of the reason why it works obviously there are styles of wrestling also but just on paper just the imagery and think about it this way Mick Foley under the Cactus Jack persona had some pretty fucking great matches with Sting of all people. So who's to say that it wouldn't have worked with The Rock? We obviously know it does work with The Rock. I think Mick was one of those people that could just elevate a match with whoever the fuck he was in the ring with. Which is really something that's not 
talked about with Mick. Everybody no, it, talks about his spots, but the dude can fucking work. Yeah, he could, man. And he made a lot of the people that he worked with. Yeah. It's the same way with Austin, dude. Like, before his neck injury, he wasn't a bad technical wrestler. No. I mean, look at it this way with, with Foley, though. Arguably, Shawn Michaels was already on his way to greatness, but at Mind Games in your house when they had their title match in 1996? I believe, yeah. He, yeah. he absolutely made Shawn that kind of brute wrestler. Like, he showed that Shawn could actually brawl and added another layer to Shawn's like, repertoire as a wrestler. Coming back to The Rock, made The Rock a little more aggressive as a wrestler. Yeah, because he had already turned heel, but it's almost like you knew that he was a bad guy, but he wasn't a bad son of a bitch until he started locking horns with mankind. Right, because a couple of spots in this match, one of them being that fucking area where they're fighting near the entrance ramp, there's a DDT through one of the little production tables that was a pretty good spot, but then they're walking back from like some under carriage to bleachers over there and Foley's got Dwayne in a headlock and then Rock just fucking side suplexes him on the fucking concrete <laughs> and I audibly and visibly cringed at it I was like I physically was just like oh like I fucking just like drawed back into my fucking chair it's like oh my god like that kind of shit makes me hurt Cause like Mick is not a small dude to be doing that shit, man. No, and you can see his heels impact the floor with every fucking suplex. Yeah, dude. I'm like fuck. And like even the vertical suplexes Rock was giving. It- now, granted, they were on the padding, but the vertical suplexes he was given fully, like at the side of the ring, Mick carried all of his weight in his hips and his legs. That's the part of the body that takes the most brunt of that impact with a vertical suplex. And all I could think was fucking shit. No wonder that dude walked fucked up. He took so many bumps on his legs and his hips. Dude, and it's really one of those things that as a kid, you don't think about. You're just like, oh, yeah, he'll he'll feel that tomorrow. You don't think about the location of where he's feeling it and the fact that he's got to move around and shit. You don't think about where weight is distributed. You don't think about any of that shit until you're older. And then all of a sudden, like, oh, shit, the weather dropped and my knees hurt. Right. There's another spot in here where The Rock takes the headset from Cole. He's like, get out of here, you jabroni. Like, he fucking shoves him (laughs) off. He's like, get get out of The Rock's way. (laughs) Fucking does start doing commentary and shit. Dude, the, The Rock is one of the funniest fucking dudes to ever do it. I'm sorry, but god damn. No, he really is, man. And then uh, at one point, he sings the fucking Smackdown Hotel. Like He sings Heartbreak Hotel by Elvis, but with mm-hmm. Smackdown Hotel. And he's down at the end of Jabro and he drive and just like fucking around with Foley. And like, this is the Rock's gift to you, Memphis. It's like, oh, my God. And Jerry Lawler's like, he's singing better than Elvis. Right. Uh, a couple other spots in here that we had to laugh at. So. Foley picks up the top half of the steel stairs and he just throws them into the ring like they're nothing. Okay. I'm saying that to make this point later on. Mick gets just annihilated to the side of the ring. Rock goes inside the fucking ring and he just tumps the stairs over the top rope and they're supposed to flatly land on Foley, but the corner of the stairs hit him instead. And they just stiff and you can tell it kind of hurt like a motherfucker and Michael Cole Just, I think he legitimately reacted because it sickened him a bit because of the thud. You just hear him go, oh, gosh, darn it. (laughs) Which, as soon as that happened, dude, I had to stop. I couldn't. I was like, this is in 1999, peak Attitude Era, where everybody is like either absurdly vulgar or uses vulgar language. And Michael Cole being like... The white Steve Urkel that he is. <laughs> Fucking gosh darn it. Just the way he said, oh, gosh darn it. Those stairs are 250 pounds. And I'm like, bro, they bounced. Those stairs are not 250 pounds, my guy. <laughs> what do you think they were? They're probably like 250 ounces. 
You're welcome. <laughs> I was going to give them a little more credit, but okay. I would venture to say those steps probably weigh maybe 80 pounds at the most. Because you got to think about the way that they're built. Because whenever I saw them bounce, I was like, well, what the fuck? What, what is that, like five pounds? <laughs> but then I think about, well, no, it's got like the air from the inside because they're not fully constructed stairs. It's like a thin layer, you know? Yeah, the bulk of the steps are where the uh, the corners meet and shit, exactly, you know, where they're yeah. welded and stuff. Yeah. I do need to point something out that we'll get to about the stairs and the ring in general, which I, th- I thought was fucking funny, like in the next match. But the ending of this match, now they've been taking chair shots and Foley gets backdropped off the table into the timekeeper's spot where the back of his head just cracks the table and his legs <sighs> land on the fucking bell. Like, that hurt to watch all of this DDT is on the chair rock bottom. They hit each other in the head at the same time with steel chairs and they can't answer the 10 count. And that's the draw finish that they knocked each other out with steel chairs. Yeah. Cause not only is the draw aspect of it all bullshit, which the crowd chanted. Yeah. But it's like it, you know what it is, dude? It's the Superman syndrome where you, You mean you can get thrown through all these buildings, you can get shoved through an exploding fucking pipeline tank, you can all this stuff, but you can get your neck snapped? Like Superman can punch Zod a million times through buildings, but then snap his neck with his bare hands? Right. The logic isn't there. Yep, and that's why the crowd chanted bullshit. And this was a 22-minute match. Yeah, so it's like we watched all of this for that. Yeah. And I didn't even think about it until we started talking about it because I was just like enthralled by the fact that I'm watching The Rock versus Mankind. Exactly, and the ending should have matched it. Now, I I get why they needed to keep this shit going, but my God, they've been trading this belt back and forth for two fucking months, dude. So I guess let's get into the main event, which I don't know if this match time was when the bell rang. Okay. The match is listed at seven minutes and 55 seconds. Oh, it had to be then. Like, no, this was the actual segment was longer than seven minutes. Yeah, because the story of this one is that Vince McMahon won the Rumble. And he dropped out of the number one contender spot. He literally won it so that Austin would not be able to wrestle. (laughs) Which is some petty bullshit. But at the same point, Austin was like, I don't even want the championship to be champion. I just wanted to dismantle the fucking establishment. (laughs) Right. So it's like, okay, well, you you guys are equally fucking petty women. It's pretty funny, though. (laughs) But at the time, Shawn Michaels, I believe, was still was the uh, was he the commissioner at the time, I believe, because I think? well, because he was the one that popped up on the screen with Austin at a bar. That's right. And he looked yeah. at yeah, because he looked at Vince. He's like, well, technically speaking, if you drop out of the main event, like you forfeit your Rumble victory or whatever, the runner up gets that spot. So he gave it to Austin. I can't get over this. The fact that fucking Vince won the Rumble. He had to. He had to. It was so fucking dumb, like in the best way. So Austin puts his title shot at WrestleMania on the line just to get Vince in a cage match. Now, I want to point something out about this cage and the rest of the fucking ring that we noticed. (laughs) How cheap is Vince McMahon? Stop. Stop. Nope, I refuse. We all grew up on the royal blue steel cage and the royal blue ring steps and the royal blue steel posts. What is this we, motherfucker? Myself and the listening audience that remembers this shit, you fucking infant. (laughs) (laughs) I am but a fetus. You a fetus. (laughs) No, but no, no, seriously, like there's times where you notice the paint getting just chipped yeah and you can see the blue <laughs> underneath it like god damn that blue paint is strong because vince was just like i don't want to buy anything new just spray paint it all black are you sure it's not gonna ah, spray paint it all right do you think he thought that 
resolution for playbacks wouldn't get this crisp. So he was just like, eh, they're never going to notice it. I don't think he gave a shit, honestly. <laughs> I'd like to give him some credit. I'll never notice it. <laughs> just spray paint it black. Everything else is black. We got the black logo and the black ring apron, which I thought was hilarious about this fucking pay-per-view. Like, I miss the little old school, minuscule, small, low key entrances and shit, mm-hmm. like the entry ramps. But this pay per view was so almost an afterthought that they put the house show banners on the fucking ceiling and the fucking ring apron. Yeah, like I was noticing the sets because when I think of like old school wrestling like this, I think of like the design work and everything. Motherfucker, well, this. Nothing about it felt like Valentine's Day. It felt like a small Halloween bash at your fucking high school. <laughs> that's funny, though. But th- that's the thing. St. Like, Valentine's Day massacre. Like, I think the most they did was put blood droplets on the curtain. Yeah, like it was a whole lot of nothing. Like they had the fucking like vampire bats around the entranceway. Oh, the little gargoyle thing. Yeah. Oh, my God. Which looked cool. Like I. I would have like a replica of that in my house. It looked dope. Well, they looked like demonic cupids. That's probably what it was going for. Okay. Because whenever I was looking at it, I was like, did they reuse some old props from a Halloween special that I didn't see? Like, what is this? I don't know. And also, it's not to discredit the show, but aside from the main event, there was no color at all in this show and whenever i hear saint valentine's day massacre i'm like oh shit so so this is gonna be like a like a whole ass pay-per-view of hardcore shit oh my god what are we in for (laughs) we we see blood at the very end and barely yeah especially the fact that you had a hardcore match and a last man standing match it's odd now granted I think the the person to get color was the one like that should have gotten the most. I get that, but I don't know. It was it, it was odd. No, I get that. Now this match really there was I hate to say it, but there was nothing to this. Yes and no. Like it should have been more memorable than the shit it was memorable for. Yes, but at the same time, like. Fuck, Austin can work a crowd. Sure, yeah. I mean, that's the whole point is that you want to see Austin beat the shit out of Vince. Like He does. Oh, yeah. Like They start the match. Like I should point this out. They start the match outside of the ring. Technically, the match doesn't start. Like Vince is goading Austin into coming outside. Well, Austin just finally goes outside, chases his ass, and they kind of beat the shit. Well, I say they beat the shit out of each other. He beats the shit out of Vince through the crowd, around the ring. And then the psycho ass table bump that Vince takes. Dude, whenever I saw that, I was like, holy shit. Vince, you you doing this shit? Dude, when I was watching this live, I at that time was like, man, Vince is old. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> Wait. Hold on, hold on. He had to be like what? 40 something? No, I think Vince was in his 50s here. Pro yeah. Yeah, Vince was 54. Okay, so... Or he was about to be 54 that year. So he's older than I thought, granted, but... Yeah, but you got to understand, at the time, I'm sitting there like, okay, I had never seen McMahon ripped like that until, like a, I think, a few months earlier or something. I was like, why? How the fuck? You know, and, and me being young and <laughs> yeah. stupid, I was like, oh, steroids, but, but anyway, anyway. <laughs> I was like, man, this dude jacked the fuck i didn't realize under that suit i I was always picturing vince as like this wrinkly old man that was just this tycoon of of wrestling 54 years old oh yeah he's wrinkly as fuck i was 13 dude you can't tell me (laughs) i know i know you can't tell me at 13 you didn't think like 35 40 year olds were old you've been calling my ass old for years i know dude (laughs) but either way yeah like but at the time i was sitting there like oh my god like the bump that we are talking about is when vince and austin on the outside of the cage austin slams his head into it and vince just like bobblehead bounces and just yeets himself sideways through the spanish announce table where fucking hugo semenovich 
sells this like a fucking soccer player. Doesn't even get touched. <laughs> like he just he slumps over shit like LeBron. <laughs> he fucking just slumps over like he got shot. And he's just, oh. Uh, and he stayed down too. That's what cracks me up. They always would go. You ever notice the Spanish team just goes flying every time somebody goes to the table? They just like they just uh, they go sideways and just ver, ver, fucking down for the camera. Oh shit! It's a pay per view. We gotta be extra. You they know, pay for this. You know, I've always wondered something. What? You know how? Okay, so without fail, anytime the English announce table gets just plowed through, mm-hmm. they're still on commentary. Yeah, 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 yeah. Do they just have like a backup Spanish announce team where they're just like? Okay, now we're the secondary team because the table got fucking plowed through. Okay, now's our time to shine. Oh my fucking like, god. You know, <laughs> you know how funny that shit would be? Where they're just sitting there the whole time. Like Vince doesn't even tell him that the table's like he doesn't tell him where the table spot's gonna be. He's just like, be on the lookout. Just be prepared. We're calling in an audible. And then they're just sitting there, oh shit, Ron. And then they just like <laughs> come out and they're just and they like haven't been paying attention the whole fucking time, so they have no idea what's going on. Oh, the, the McMahon is down, <laughs> and that's it. They're just that's yeah, all they say. That's all they can come up with. Austin three sixteen just whooped his ass. <laughs> like they just start like quoting dumb shit. It's like Austin three sixteen just whooped his ass. A gurney. <laughs> gurney. Yeah, like when they wheel the gurney out because yes. they fucking wheeled this gurney out. And they're about to put McMahon on this fucking stretcher. And Finkel gets in the ring and he's just like, okay, so the winner of this match and also just yoinks the microphone. He's like, eh, eh. Dude, anytime he did that shit, it was the funniest bullshit. He just gets on there and he's just like, that's bullshit. You jackass in the black is the son of a bitch still breathing. <laughs> when he said that, I fucking died. Oh, I crack up every time he does some shit like that because I'll remember at the time like that was some kind of borderline outlandish shit to say out loud especially at a wrestling pay-per-view where I mean I get that's the character but like you've got to think about the times that was a little bit not overboard but ooh, you don't realize people that still believed in that shit were just like he's gonna kill him (laughs) like is he still breathing good he can wrestle I don't give a fuck if his neck's broken I'm gonna beat his ass it's like damn Steve (laughs) But for real, he's like, you jackass in the black is the son of a bitch still breathing. And as far as I'm concerned, this ain't over. And he just comes out and just, he just hauls ass with him and just rolls him into the fucking uh, Dude, steel cage on the outside. The fucking way he just climbed that fucking cage and just jumped down and shit. I was like, God damn, what the fuck? You, you practically just worked a full match. Without even the having the bell ring. I just love that he starts beating his ass with the spinal board. That yellow long spinal board. Bruh, he's just whooping his ass. And he didn't even hold back with it. He's fucking cracked his ass. Well, you know, McMahon wanted them to lay their shit in. Like, Vince, I will give him that. You know, we, we do shit on Vince a lot for some of the fucked up shit he's done in the booking decisions. But I have to give credit where it's due. The motherfucker went out there and took licks. Yeah, I mean... Dude, he's not willing to make anybody do something that he wouldn't do. Shit, whenever he did the fucking jump onto the, what was it? The, uh, like, some kind of, like, inflatable fucking thing where he jumped off the roof or some bullshit. Are you talking about he was teaching old boy how to take that stunt fall? Yeah. Here recently as of last year? Yeah, yeah, I thought that was fucking amazing. He's he's pushing, like, se- he's pushing 80. He's, like, 75. Yeah, I was about to say, he ain't pushing 70. He He's pushing 80 now yeah and he just without missing a beat he takes his fucking suit jacket off and just dives tie and fucking <laughs> slacks and everything doesn't give a fuck about his own well-being no dude in fact he took the bump the same way he went through that fucking table but austin throws him back in the goddamn ring and then the match starts and then vince bleeds like a stuck pig we had to point this shit out actually you did it was funny so austin goes to leave the ring like a few times to win. Vince keeps giving him the finger. So Austin's like, uh-uh, fuck that. And he comes back in the ring, which we both were just like, dude. You could have just stepped out, won the match, then hopped back in. But instead, you were just like, nope. Technically speaking, 
The match is still continuing. So therefore, he signed a contract. I'm not going to jail if I beat my boss's ass. I'm going to legally whoop his fucking ass. Now, the finish to this match, I thought was pretty decent. But I remember at the time watching this on pay-per-view, not expecting this and fucking marking out for Paul White. He just comes from under the ring. Like, you know, like Undertaker used to just slice the canvas open and crawl. Yeah. Yeah. So Paul just shows up. Now, granted, Vince McMahon had guaranteed that none of the corporate people were going to interfere in this match. This was his secret weapon. So he's telling Paul, pick him up and throw him into the fucking cage. Paul just scoops him up right into the cage and the cage just busts open. And Austin just kind of looks and falls out and wins the match. But the look on his face where he's like, I fucking won. I know. He he looked genuinely shocked. It was so great. He's like, I fucking won. (laughs) Yo, Adrian, I I did it? Yeah. (laughs) But McMahon selling the crybaby angle in this was really funny. And Paul was pissed off. There's a shot right before the pay-per-view goes off air where Steve's at the entryway and he's looking back in the ring <laughs> and, and he's, this. he's throwing his hands up like measuring Paul how big he's like. He's like, look at this big stupid son of a bitch. I fuck you. And he fucking like leaves. <laughs> fucking <laughs> Austin's a goat, man. Oh, hell yeah, he is, man. But yeah, Austin wins the match and all in all, pretty entertaining pay-per-view. I, I, I haven't thought about this yet because we didn't do this for the Rumble pay-per-view. Do you think we should give any of these uh, pay-per-views a rating? Yeah, might as well. Like you want to do it out of what, a 10 or a 5 or? Yeah, we can do 1 to 10. All right. For you, what would what would you say just just on viewing? Give it a 7, 7.5, you know? Yeah, I think I, I think I'll go with like a seven on this one, and it's mostly because Foley and The Rock was both a pro and a con because I feel like it was a great match, but the ending kind of blew ass. Right. There were a couple of hidden gem matches on this pay per view. Like I thought the hardcore title match was fun. The tag title match was like a pretty solid, great match, and then like the comedy kind of shit with Billy Gunn in the in the IC title match was really good and then of course you can't go wrong watching Vince and Austin because that will draw money every fucking time. Yeah, I I think really the only aside from the Rock and Mankind ending really if they tightened the show up, removed the opening, have the tag team be the opening, okay? And then Remove the boss man match right there. We can get like, like we can cut out two to three matches altogether. Think about this. Gold dust and blue dust was on the card Mm -hmm. as the opening contest. However, the dark match was Brian Christopher and Scott Taylor versus the Hardy boys. Yeah, I would have swapped that. I definitely would have swapped that same. And I love gold dust. Don't get me wrong. Same dude. Like, Can I just point out real quickly that right now, as we speak, I really believe Dustin Rhodes is doing some of the best work of his career. Oh, I think it's undeniable. I I think a lot of people agree with that. Yeah. I've read it a million times online in different forums. Match of the night. Probably Austin and McMahon, just because while Rock and Mankind was equally as entertaining I feel like the Austin and McMahon match, it was cover to cover better. It didn't have anything tainting its own legacy. Right. And again, it's the most memorable match of the pay-per-view. And yeah, I think that's the match of the night myself. So that's all I got to say. Yeah. I had a great time watching it, though. Same. Visit SuperMediaBrosPodcast.com for past, present, and future episodes. Go to oddpodsmedia.com to listen to all the other shows on the Odd Pods Media Network. Subscribe to us on YouTube. Follow us on social media. Buy the merchandise. It's in the show notes below. Just scroll up and click. Yeah. Get that shit. It's very comfy. Yes, it is. Pajama time. <laughs> leave us a rating and review on Podchaser, Good Pods, or Apple Podcasts. You can leave individual ratings and reviews on Good Pods and Podchaser. 
like on episodes, you know, we, we do out of five stars on those, not 10. So make like Rob Van Dam and give us a five star frog splash on those motherfuckers. S M B. <laughs> Just point S M B. I had a fucking blast talking about this pay-per-view. Dude, I feel like we needed this. Oh, we, absolutely. We needed to talk wrestling on the show. Hell yeah, I'm never going to turn down an opportunity to talk about wrestling, which we're going to do a shit ton more of. Good, so good, So just good. be prepared, everybody out there. Next week, we're going to come back with a cult cinema showdown. It's going to be ticks versus slugs. Yeah, you, you want to get real nasty, it's going to be some fucking gross-ass bug shit. Motherfucker, I ain't even never heard of these. Oh, it's great. It's a good time. <laughs> it's a good fucking time. If you want to do your homework, both these movies are on fucking YouTube, so do that shit. Oh, God. Anytime you say, oh, yeah, the movie's on YouTube, I'm like, oh, dear God. No, it's cool. I got the remastered <laughs> uh, version of Ticks from Vinegar Syndrome, and then I got Slugs from Arrow Video, so. Oh, it's not the fact that it's it's the resolution. It's like, oh, they don't even. They ain't care. They, they, they don't care. They're just going to slap it on YouTube. They're like, eh, fuck it. And then after that, we're going to come back and talk about Poppy. Let's go. Let's go. In March, we are going to do a bonus review of the AEW Revolution pay-per-view whenever that happens. But for the rest of the month, we're going full-blown DC. Ooh. So be prepared for that shit. It's, uh, it's not what you think, though. <laughs> okay. Don't act like you don't know what this, this schedule is. Oh, I, I know, but... For the audience at home, I'm would, speaking would, for them. Do you want me to to let them in on a couple of things, or do you want us to like surprise their asses with this shit? Subtle hints. Okay, there's a little bit of Keanu Reeves. There's a little bit of Josh Brolin. There's a little bit of John Cena. There's a little bit of Clooney. There's a little bit of Pattinson. So, do with that information what you will. Was Twilight a DC property? I hope not. <laughs> God. <laughs> On that note, we should get the fuck out of here. I bet. Thank you all so very much for checking this episode out. This was WWF St. Valentine's Day Massacre 1999, episode 211. Until next time, I've been Midnight Agent Raw. And I'm Special Delivery Dev. Shades on. We're off. <laughs>